Welcome to More Than Dice, episode 219. Uh, Kathy is off this week, so we have in, decided to invite Big Jim Slade uh, to join us for this episode. So, um, for More Than Dice, I'm Gonzo. I'm John. And I'm Slade. <laughs> Not Kathy. <laughs> Uh, so, we are going to be talking about RPGs and GMing before we get into everything. Um, and so, um, we've titled this Three GMs and an Audience. So, y'all could ask questions and give us hell about things that's going on. So, other than that, let's go ahead and get down to the business. We want to thank all of our sponsors. Let's go ahead and get them on. Let's thank some Midnight Heroes. If you like some good chibi models and pay attention i believe they're going to reaper con and be showing off their new miniature game they got going on uh go over and check them out and if you use the code more than dice you'll get 10 percent off your order we want to thank muse on minis also for hosting us they also gave us a discount code and you can get 10 percent off anything there um by using more than dice um we also want to thank mini masterworks where you get the awesome paint shakers and all the cool different things that you can get from everybody else game envy um and they've got a discount code also. Use more than dice. You see a pattern here, people. Um, then no. we also want to thank Parabellum War Games, the makers of Conquest, make a amazing, amazing uh, rank and flank game. And they are working on a new um, rule set for uh, First Blood, which is their skirmish version of the game. So pay attention and wait for that. And you can also use a discount code with them. You may want to guess what the code is. More than dice. I want a word. Yep. That's oh. right. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Uh, and don't forget, we have um, uh, Turbo Dork, which has got some good metallic and color shifting paints. Look at that. Big Jim's got some right there. Uh, and next weekend, we will give away another $50 gift certificate to Turbo Dork. So uh, make sure you come back. Make sure you save up those dice hit dice, and you can spend them on uh, getting into that drawing. So, other than that, guys, let's talk about it. We have any shout outs this week, John? Uh, God, I don't know any. It sounds horrible every time I have to say it this way. No one that came across my radar. Let's say. Yeah, we'll say that. That might be the nicest way to say it. Yeah. Um, I don't know anything, Jim. No, uh, well, uh, yeah, I will actually do one shout out for a lot of the miniature painting community that I'm involved in. I want to shout out the Fabulous Marines 2022. I'm being a part of that. A whole lot of folks were trying to raise $15,000 this month of June for the Trevor Project. So it's the fabulousmarines.com and a boatload of uh, Twitch and non Twitch uh, miniature painters and content creators. Nice. Uh, let's get some really important news. I mean, this 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 is what everybody's waiting for. John, what are you drinking? Uh, I decided to make an alcoholic vanilla Coke, which is Coke that Banyan apparently had in his basement since before his heart attack and can't drink anymore, <laughs> and tasked me with drinking it uh, with some forty three vanilla liqueur. Oh, Big we'll Jim, see how that get? goes. Uh, right now, I am actually just drinking um, some water with a little bit of cherry flavor in it because this weekend I managed to get through most of a bottle of bourbon while I was out camping. So I want to make sure if I tell my body, yes, I do enjoy hydrating you as well sometimes. <laughs> what? It sounds it's, like communism. It's this, yeah, it's this weird thing. You know, my body tells me it hates me if I don't do that. <laughs> Um, I am doing some Remy Martin XO, and we'll be drinking that tonight uh, a little bit. I'm still uh, getting over uh, salmonella poisoning. I'm on my last bit of my antibiotics, so I'm not going to push myself too hard with that right now. Uh, which, by the way, um, really, really sucks. I'm on my ninth day of antibiotics. Technically, my almost my 15th day of antibiotics because the first round didn't go so well, so they gave me 10 days worth on top of it. Mm -hmm. So... I'm getting over that right now. Um, guys, please take care of yourself. Please wash your hands. Please you know, wear a mask when you feel like you need to. Um, yeah, if you're sick like I was, wear a fucking mask. Yeah. 
don't go anywhere that you don't need to just look after yourself um some conventions are starting back up again uh even though you know they still require either a mask mandate or vaccine or both um we want to see you at them we want to have you come out and join us when you can and play games um and also we just want to you know make sure i did um hear somebody that um today i learned listened to one of our rpgs uh, that is overseas, and uh, I thought it was very interesting. I learned that today, so it's actually really cool. Uh, Chaos Born Gaming, I don't know if he's still on the channel. Uh, well, you said it was late, so maybe not. Oh, yeah, Chaos Born Gaming is still there. Someone give a shout-out to Chaos Born Gaming. Uh, they uh, they run some War Machine and Hordes podcast stuff, uh, which is really good. Uh, very good community people. And um, they told me that they listened to our Gangs of Waterdeep and was... Uh, liking a lot of things that we did and they were enjoying it and i was like that's cool it's always nice to hear from the people that listen to our stuff i did tell them to listen to like our three no three three gnomes and a half giant and our old star wars one so guys please take care of yourself we want to see you at a convention we want to hang out with you we want to do all that cool stuff cheers 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 that is fucking dangerous Hold on one more. I don't think I tasted that first time. Oh, that was tasty. V, you know what I mean. Eye twitching. I can feel my eye twitching. <laughs> I don't think that's actually good. It's not. <laughs> it, it, it's probably fine. Nothing. Yeah, what could possibly be going wrong there? <laughs> I don't know. Every time my eye starts twitching at work, they start getting worried. I don't know why. So, I thought of this subject, of course, like I normal, typical things. Uh, I messaged John, you know, because Kathy was like, hey, you know, I won't be able to be in. I'm not feeling well. I'm like, okay, no big deal. Uh, John, what do you want to do? And John's like, don't talk to me right before I'm going to be running my game, you freaking plebe. And I'm like, oh shit, he's on his time again. And so I was like, wow, really? <laughs> So I believe the exact wording was shrug emoji right before my game is not a time to ask that question. <laughs> I didn't even put bitch at the end, but in the future, I will. Oh, this isn't awkward. Okay. <laughs> and so I was thinking, and I was like, okay, we need to have somebody on. I want to talk about a subject. And I was like, I've been reading these RPGs like crazy for a while. And like always, that's all I've been doing is reading RPGs. And I was like, man... Who do I know? Oh, Big Jim Clyde. He, he he doesn't do anything with his life. He's like a nerd like us. He stays at home all the time and probably just reads, you know, RPGs too. And do anything. I'm like, sure, he's probably not doing anything. He can just get on here on a whim. And he did. So. Yeah, he's not wrong. <laughs> Look, he's out of line. <laughs> he's right. <laughs> it was rude, but accurate. Yes. So I, I like message like, hey, are you streaming today? And he's I didn't get anything. So I message V. I go, hey, I don't. Slade doesn't like respond to Facebook messages really well. Do you know the way to contact him? I went to Discord, and she goes, no, oh, he's probably still out partying. I'm like, oh, okay, probably going to be home. And I then I got your message. Home from Cape Cod is what I was doing. When yeah. We were using my first message. <laughs> and I partying. It's text and drive. I'm one of those people. <laughs> like, you're good people is what I would call those people. And so I uh, got that, and I was like, yeah, we got three GMs on. Let's talk about GMing RPGs and give our, our not our, 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 our whatever, but maybe just kind of give some things that happened. Tips. Yeah. Tips. And Tips. Kind of go over, like, what are some of our best and worst RPGs have been, rules-wise. Um, and then what, uh, what we think we can improve, what, you know, what GMs should do. You know, what was our most fun campaign that we went over? that we did um you know stuff like that and everything but i'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the paint cam because i actually want to show you another model that i worked on because i did crank up my 6k printer and reprinted a model and the detail on it is just insane so, look i'm not impressed until you get a 40k printer a 40k printer uh Bainey, on you there he's not he's Dang out with it. his kids ha <laughs> ha <laughs> So let's go ahead. I'm going to switch over to this. Bring the camera over. Do, 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 do,
so I went and I had printed a tiefling, like, I don't know, it was a rogue uh, for somebody. And then I did another print of it. And it's probably going to be a little hard to see because it's all white and grayed. But the detail on this came out much better than I thought it was. You actually have, like, sewn patterns and you can see different patterns within the clothes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like upgrading from that one to this 6K. I was like, I was kind of concerned that it wasn't going to be excuse me, as good, but it has meet and beat the expectations on the detail on this thing. Uh, it does come with a base, which I'm going to paint it all up and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I need to do some cleaning up and some hardening a little bit more because it didn't get as hardened. But this one also has the shiny detail on it. You can look at the shine from the print. Oh, yeah. Holy moly. Yeah, wow. this thing is just... It just she slides into this little spot right here with her toe, so of course it's all going to be painted, you know, separate. That's a good way to break your ankle. Yeah. So, I don't know if I can. But this printer has been, you know, really impressing me with everything uh, and the detail that goes into it. So, I'm going to try to paint this. This is like a really really cool. So I'm going to work on this Warcaster model and try to get it complete, not completed, but at least some more done on it. Um, let's see how it goes. Other than that. So Slade, talk to us about your GMing experience. I mean, you just started GMing, right? Like last week? Oh, I, actually, no, it's been almost, uh, almost six weeks now. Uh, no, actually, my first my first uh, GM was um, about two months after the first time I ever played D and D when I was in seventh grade. Uh, the, the 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 guy who brought it to the brought the red box first tried to DM, decided he didn't like it, and made me do that <laughs> instead. <laughs> um, and this was. This was, we played D&D for a little bit, and then we tried, uh, we were talking about this pre, pre pre-ramble, the Black Book Traveler realized that a bunch of seventh graders did not want to read a very complicated, oh my God, George R.R. Martin doesn't go into this much detail and complication rule book. Uh, So we went back to D&D after trying that for a little bit, and I ran the first, uh, first Redbox game of a Keep on the Borderlands. Um... And so that was, oh, 1982, I think. 81 or 82. Gotcha. Um, did that for a while, then played and GM'd off and on, going all the way up through high school into college, mostly the uh, AD&D. Uh, I had my treasured Fiend Folio, not Cthulhu uh, version. Um those types of things. And then after college, I kind of fell off the wagon on it uh, for, a, for a while. Uh, played a little bit of 3.5, did, did a little bit of Pathfinder with some friends at work, um, that sort of thing. And then bailed on 4 because I just didn't enjoy a lot of the stuff that was going on in 4. And the GM that was going to run it didn't like it. Uh either so he didn't put any effort into trying to do anything with it so um and i had just changed jobs too i actually changed careers um so kind of fell off the way fell out there um and about nine years ago um some folks that i've been playing on in the wow in a wow guild said hey my cousin's gonna run a D game you want to join i'm like oh hell yeah it's been a while uh, we started, and that was the beginning of what became the Pyro Club. That party, uh, we just finished the campaign about a month, about a month and a half, two months ago. For after seven years of playing, uh, during that time, I got back into the GM, got back into doing more uh, at a couple of the con- con- conventions around here, uh, PAX East. Uh, there's a couple of small sci-fi conventions around here too, and at the uh, FLGS. So been doing a lot of that, getting into a lot of the a lot more of the other systems as well. Um, a lot of powered by the apocalypse. A lot of oh, 
Uh, Describe what Power of the Apocalypse is. Uh, Power of the Apocalypse is uh, is a game engine, basically, is the best way to best way to put it. After uh, an apocalypse game that the name is totally escaping me, it's Apocalypse something, uh, and it is uh, D six based. Uh, multiple skills and what the nice things about the engine is it is applicable to a million different genres um kids on bikes is a is, a, is an excellent example know that game. Uh, uh i recently uh did a monster of the week campaign uh with some folks that might be uh in the chat right now <laughs> um and, and a number and a number of others that I've 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 just sort of muddled around with uh, masks, which is kind of a, a know, weird masks. hero uh, version. Uh, yeah, it's it. They're they're a lot of fun, and it's a really adaptable system to go into a million different genres. I've done some savage Savage Worlds stuff, which is nice, uh, but it it isn't as applicable. Savage World to me isn't as applicable to multiple genres as nicely and as smoothly as Apocalypse is. It's 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 not as good as it wants to be at multiple genres. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Deadlands is great. Don't get me wrong. It loves me some Deadlands, um, but it's just it doesn't it doesn't flow the same way beyond a couple of like a one or two shot. So I played Frostgrave. Uh, at one point and I like the system, but I get what you're saying. It did not. Eventually you're just like, okay, all right. Type thing. I, I, I haven't played that second one V. Um, I, I never, I have not had the opportunity to play thirsty sword lesbians. I would love to at some point in time, if anybody's running a game that would be willing to have me in it, but apparently that's not the case. Always a GM, <laughs> never the player. Also, V's V's group filled up before I had a chance to join. <laughs> <laughs> no, a D and D group fills up really quickly. Or right, an RPG what? group. Right. Look, back in the day, I used to have a waiting list to get into my game, which was the craziest thing I ever thought of. <laughs> oh yeah. Because you know, back in the day, 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 in high school, you were striving to get players, and then suddenly you become adults. And you're like people knocking down the door, like I want to be in your game, John. Like I, I've got six players. I really can't do seven. Yeah. Yeah, I made that mistake recently with some friends who wanted to get a game together. And I said, oh, I don't run a game, and it ended up being seven or eight at one point in time. Fortunately, most people were new to the game, but I had one veteran that was awesome in helping players, like help with the flow a little bit. He was awesome to have in the, in the group, but that's way too damn many. Well, yeah, that's a good DM topic. How many players is the right number? And honestly, that's probably going to depend on your experience. It's, uh, it's going to be your experience, but it's also going to be the people in that particular group. Yeah. Like one of the nice things about this was it was a group of friends that had said, hey, and I, I was very good friends with two of them in there. My wife joined for the first time ever playing a D&D type of game. Um, so that was good. The chemistry was already there. Mm -hmm. So that helps a lot. If I was going to go up onto a Discord and say, hey, I'm going to run a game, the odds are going that route there is not going to happen. Yeah, four. Um, I'd go four. Four. I can... I. I, I Four or five, um, depending on the type of game I'm running. And depending and, on who I know story. in the group. Like, yeah. complete Discord strangers, four. Oof. Don't yeah. know them. But yeah, that game I told you about where I, we had like eight people, we were all close friends. We had all the time. Yeah. And we were all, like, you know, say, adults. And I mean that in the best possible way, where some of us could sit back and let other people shine for a bit. Yeah. So you didn't ever get to the point where you felt like any one person was consistently ignored. Everyone got their time in the sun, but it's hard. Harder yeah. than me. It was interesting, too, because a lot of the folks were new. You didn't get people that were because you have a big round of combat going. And at one point in time, I threw a zombie horde. I had managed to pick up um, an STL of this really cool little zombie, and I made like 40 of them. So I'm like, I'm going to use this because why not? Um, so it, you don't get the board 
necessarily because they're trying to figure out how things are going and talking about it. it okay, what does that mean? You know, attack of opportunity. What the heck? And so you don't necessarily get that stagnation mm-hmm. in in a group like that. Um, so if they were more expert, that would be a factor in there too. Of, yes. You know, you know, well, I know what I'm going to do, so I'm just going to look at my phone for the next three turns. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, we're doing Feng Shui 2 now, and that's a game where really you don't even use a map, which makes you mm-hmm. weirdly able to do different things. Yeah. You know, they're trying to go like, well, I need to know what's where. Like, no, no, you don't need to know what's where. If you want to run over there and grab a fucking torch, if it makes sense there's a torch there, there's a fucking torch there. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> You know, it's 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 freeing to have both those kinds. You mentioned not liking fourth edition. It's a particular type of game. If yeah. You don't like the sort of hardcore combat mechanics because that's what most of those mechanics are based on. Mm-hmm. Though it did have really interesting skill resolution that never really got used. But yeah, um, if you don't like that, that's not your thing. But that's part of it. Is is I would say the first rule of jamming is don't re- re- don't jam a game you're not into. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, because you can't. I mean. If you're not, I mean, you could to a point, like if you really like your friends and all that, you can get something, but it's not going to be your best effort. No. It's not, you're just not going to be inspired. And it, it makes it hard because I am exactly like that. <clears throat> it is hard sometimes for me to really dive into trying a new system without finding somebody to run a game for me first. Yes, that would be best. Um, That's like the ideal world. The circle would be someone gets a new game. So they're like the best GM ever in the history of the universe. They run that game, you play it, you're inspired, you have the game, and now you run it. And then someone else does it. It's a circle of gaming that's yep. supposed to be. It doesn't end up like that, but that's how it should be. Right, right. And that's that was that was one of the things, like, PAX East, I mentioned earlier, is not a tabletop-based convention. But the convention hall in here in Boston is massive, so they have a huge area they are able to dedicate to it. And there's a lot of crossover in that, uh, yeah. in those genres. I mean, oh, let's... oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But that, there's a lot of folks there that are doing just that. It's like, hey, I really like this system. I don't have enough friends to do it, so I'm just going to put a flag on a table and say, hey, I'm running Monster of the Week. Come sit for a little while. And that's awesome. I've got I, some great stuff out of that. Yeah, I've done uh, some old, uh, you know, back when uh, Origins moved from place to place. Mm-hmm. It was in Baltimore in like 90 or 91. I got to go to that. They used to have AtlantaCon. I played a lot of just random games that were just super fun. It is so much fun sitting down sometimes with mm-hmm. random people all looking to have a good time. Yep. Just have a good time playing a game. Yeah, I got that with Fiasco, which I never would have played otherwise. Yeah. I was just you randomly that. jumping into a group Ooh. playing Fiasco. Uh, Cookie's got a question. Yeah, it's good actually question. a really good question. Yeah. Uh, Cookie wants to know for someone that's never DM but, uh, but has a one shot, how do you get the nerve to run it? It terrifies me. And this is actually general life lessons. Same way you handle. Speaking in front of people when you're not ready to or anything, you put on your poker face and you just do it. Yeah. If your players sense confidence, they will have more fun. Mm-hmm. Just do and it. There's, a, there's also a little background of this is Cookie does have a one shot that he's been setting up that is for part of the community, one of the communities we're in. Um, and Cookie. He, if you're going to do it, this is the best group to find people to do this in. And that works off of kind of what John said is you have, if you have some people that are just dying to try it, you know, I, I had my first shot one time and I was exactly the same way. I was, mm-hmm. when we started streaming the pyro club, I wasn't GMing on the stream uh, stream first stream GMing. I did. Holy shit, I was so nervous. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> scared to death. Spoiler, I still get nervous that my players aren't going to have fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, that never goes away. No, it doesn't. That's You're always hoping that they're going to they're gonna have fun and you get to do it right, and then there's always this, shit, did I do something wrong? Are you not having fun? Do we need to cancel it? Right. And you'll always have that feeling like that. The players are high-fiving. And as they're heading out of the session, they're like, oh, that was so cool. Da, 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 da. And you're driving home going, oh, God, I can't fucking believe I did that. And it, oh, man, I totally screwed that one thing oh, up. I, and... Man, I, I, <laughs> I, I had that plot point come up way too quick. I should have fucking taken my time yep, more with that yep, one. Yep. But don't let it bother you. Yeah. It's, it's the key to life, but don't let it bother you. If they had fun, 
here's a secret. There's a bunch we bitched about this, or I bitched about this on a podcast a while ago. A whole stream of things of uh, uh, YouTube videos of how to win at role playing. You don't need a stream of videos. I'll tell you right now. If everyone has fun, you mm-hmm. fucking won. Mm-hmm. That's it. Just that. It's the end all be all rule. If everyone had a good time, we we did this thing at one point in time where, um, uh, so we had three GMs in the Pyro Club main part main group, and when the one that was actually running our campaign couldn't make it, <clears throat> we'd still put a thing on, and we would take just th- suggestions from chat, and we'd improvise literally every single bit of that, and I'll tell you, it, it was it was bizarre we did it on a whim i am so glad because that's so much fun and it's a great example of practicing for that and getting past some of those hang-ups those are the best skills you can have improv skills i mean there's that joke thing of uh you know the captain america and hulk thing you know i'm mm-hmm. always angry but it's like jim how are you always prepared you know you know it's like, i'm not <laughs> i am so <laughs> it seems not. like you're never winging it. it's like that's my secret i'm always, always winging, winging it, it. Which brings up the point of what I always wanted to talk about on this new game system that I'm going to be testing out, which, like, three of the players are inside the chat right now, or used to be, or still are, I don't know. Um, and this game, when you set it up, you have the characters, five people, create real-world flawed humans. And they kind of go, uh, make them teenagers, because that's easy to do. You remember, you know, how you know, as a teenager. Um and so you have to make up three, you have to make up a flawed teenager. And then the GM has to use what happens in those flawed characters in the story. So he doesn't get to make it up. He doesn't get to like pre-plan much. So it's just like immediately right then and there, he's got to have everything done. And they do a really good uh, discussion on how this should happen. Um, I was reading the book and they had a lot of cool things. This game is basically you play off the fears of the characters and the emotions that the characters have. And so, of course, they introduce, you know, aftercare session and they introduce, you know, the red card, uh, which is a good thing for this. Because, I mean, you could touch on some subjects uh, about what this is going to be on. But you've got to pretty much do all this on the fly. And so I'm going to be practicing this with the group. And now we're going to cut it down in a couple of different episodes just because, you know, real life. But I've got to figure out, you know, all the stuff that happens to these characters within this dungeon Mm -hmm. based on their fears and their problems. And so everything has to be done on the fly. GMs are great at impromptu. That's like, I think to to me, I think that's the Mm -hmm. hardest part of GMing. It's not figuring out the dungeons. It's impromptu. Yeah. The the hardest... Go ahead. Go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. I was just going to say, no, the hardest part of GMing is when you're doing a thing and they say, well, what's that NPC's name? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> yeah, don't patch my friend it's on a, that. It's a Jimmy. Yeah, it's Fred. <laughs> we, Bob. We had a, 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 a Decker that helped the Shadowrun party named Squeeze Pad because I couldn't come up with a name. And behind one of the players was a box of Squeeze Pads you put in. Uh, card boxes to keep the cards from moving. So I'm like, fuck it, his name's Squeeze Pad. Why? <laughs> because it's Shatterrun. It's a fucking street name. Who cares? You can get away with that in Shatterrun real life. Yeah. Yeah. Or if it's a goblin, you can make up really stupid goblin names yeah. really quickly. Oh, uh, all my goblins are automatopoeia. <laughs> 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 they always are. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the one I was going to say is that uh, the big difference, uh, the biggest illustration I saw of being ready to improvise is running, we were running... I was running the fourth edition pre-made scenarios for D&D. And at one point, the players, even though it's just purely a pre-made scenario, there's no extra in there, was like, well, we're going to sneak in through the front door, and here's how we're going to do it. There's no rules for that, but I'm like, fuck it, roll some dice, let's go. And the halfling walked up to the ogre stronghold and said, I brought you food. Well, of course they opened the door for food, and then they ganked them. Perfect. Perfect. But on the flip side, one of the earlier scenarios, uh, I was playing it and I'd run it, so I was playing stupid a little bit. And the the GM, I'm like, hey, the police is like, hey, we're going to pretend that we're the guys who came to kill us and they succeeded. And of course, nothing is scenario for that, but the GM just didn't do anything. He ran the scenario stock bog standard and it really crushed our groove, you know? So it sort of really was a super illustration of me. You've got to be ready to improvise, even in a pre-made 
Mm-hmm. Fucking just wing it. Make things make sense, you know? Give them a small advantage. Just think about it. It can be... It can be the difference between, eh, that was a fine and fun, and fuck it, hey, that was the coolest thing ever. And they, they'll, they're, they're putting in a lot of these new systems this basic disclaimer of if you are going to spend time doing a lot of prep, you are wasting your time with this yep. system. Yep. And that's kind of, I take that to heart, even in 5e or anything like that is I'll put some basic storyline things together and here's some plot points that are going to happen, whether the characters do something or not, but it's just how it presents itself. Uh, I would say time is better spent making NPCs and locations in your world in the area, just spreading out as you go, just so you're ready for them to curveball you and just yeah. let it flow. Make sense. You know, if you've got this cool encounter, it's going to be like this total badass encounter and your PCs find a way around it. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. They're thinking they're your best. That's Let's give them the bonus. Of like, <clears throat> hey, look, you defeated this encounter without having to kill anyone. That's a great job. Yeah. And I think that that's that's really interesting because I was watching an interview that had like Mercer and Colville and a bunch of those those guys on this panel. <clears throat> and one of the things I said is the most rewarding thing for them is when a player outsmarts and comes up with this out of left field solution of this insurmountable problem you put in front of them. And you're like pissed, but you're like oh, so proud at the same time. <laughs> I would say um, in that um if you if you love watching Critical Role and all those do it, don't necessarily think you can do what they oh, do. Matt yeah, Mercer is a fucking legend. But if you're going to watch one and you're not sure and you want to see an idea like Cookie, if you want to see how they do it online, check out Dimension 20. Yes. Because Brendan seems like he gets outsmarted and he fucking loves it. Mm-hmm. It seems the most attainable of them, even though it's like great quality. Yep. Like, no... He's up there, but it just feels so much more like I could attain yeah. that. Um, and yeah, and that's think, really uh, hard when you get a lot of those these really great oh, streams. Yeah, and a lot of really great things. And but yeah, he is. He I love watching him because the joy he gets yes. out of the game is like, so obvious. Yeah, there's there was a clip I saw of like someone where they like laid out this whole plan. He's like, "Did I just get Ocean's Eleven on my own game?" Yes, it was great. He just tossed yeah. papers over his shoulder one point I was watching. He's like, well, don't need that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Been there, just, done that. But, you know, you can take something, even from just learn from what you can of them. Don't try and be exactly that. You can learn from these, see what they do, how they describe things, and try to take a little of that in your own. Um, Dyer's actually got a question. Uh, says that they struggle with, uh, for three plus years, how to balance uh, challenge rating or make proper enc- fighting encounters for over five players. So there's clear D&D challenge rating for four players and no magic items when you have six players really struggle to balance. Help. Here's the thing. Just fucking wing it. Send as much as you want. They don't know how many hit points things have. If someone says, according to the monster manual, things have X hit points, I'm sorry, but that player's going to have to eat a bunch of attacks because you don't do that. No one cares. Uh, There's a reason why GMs hide their screen. Not only to protect the players if something bad goes away, but also to put something in place to say, yeah, he hit you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if, if first time someone says, hey, look, that's not important, I will alter them as I see fit. These are guidelines. And usually that's enough. But just throw stuff out there. Seeing what you think is like a cool encounter. If you think the big bad guy should have two sub-lieutenants and like, 10 minions bring that and then if you need to have them do stupid but logical shit stuff that doesn't make tactical sense but maybe they're scared for a turn and they hesitate because somebody did something badass i mean hell we had one uh of the last session of three times a half giant where uh the half ogre did did something like i want to make an intimidate check and like fucking pimps intimidate check i'm like that bad guy just runs the minions though the mooks don't mooks aren't scared because they're stupid but the, the he just, nope, out, I'm out. I'm just go back to the tall grass and fade away. Like that Homer scene where he goes back into the bush. Yeah. Just like that. <laughs> you know, let people get away with stuff like that, you know. But you, you have to wing it. There's no magic. No matter how much a game tells you this is the proper challenge for your players, it can't account for good or bad roles. And sometimes you have to, if they're rolling poorly, you've got to wing it and make them a little easier. 
Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're rolling really good. You either let them have an easier encounter, like you guys did a great job, you were inspired, becomes a thing. Maybe some of their legends bigger and people expect bigger things of them. Or you can wing it and make things a little more harder than they were. Maybe that bad guy's got a couple more hit points just so you can do something cool that needs to be done. You know, remember, it's about the story. Do what's right for the story, not what's right for the mechanics. I, uh, for a long time, I have gotten in this habit, in, especially in in-persons, that I'll have a stat block for whatever the thing is that will just have basic stats. It doesn't have AC or hit points on it, though. What I do is I have a like a legal pad or another pad next to me, and I tally off things, and I'll make a little note. Just because it's not that I expect players to cheat or anything like that. I want to keep a level of my own improvisational flexibility for exactly that reason. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll figure out the AC eventually, so that's fine. But it could have 80 hit points. It could have 300 hit points. It depends on how things are going. Yep, and... and... Always, you know, just don't worry about it if they figure stuff out. Like, my PC is blanched when the bandit leader they're allied with, and they started figuring out, like, wait, that didn't hit, but that's a, oh, my God, we were mm-hmm. going to fight that person? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's great to see that occasionally. Let, let them figure it out, but they're not worried about it. My, my PC has never been super worried about the numbers are. I love them for that. They're just there to have, they just roll their dice and have a good time. Like, I don't think yeah. this hits. We'll give it a shot. Let's see. Um, um, oh, and, v, v has yes. a great follow question there of how much do you yes. let the dice decide things? Um, it depends. And, and that's that's the tricky part as a GM. Of one of the things is, do I want this thing to swing and smash the player, or do I need to hold off on smashing the player right now? Two right. rules that got to go. Or well, yeah, basically the two rules that have to go is the rule of cool has to abide. Yes. Mm-hmm. If it's cool, you might have to let the dice roll go. The other rule is the fuck around and find out. If your PCs have consistently, or that PC has consistently fucked around, he must at some point find out. I think for me to, yeah, and that's that's really the key is, for me, I will normally let the dice decide things. And that's an agreement that we have, and I'm sure we'll talk about this particular topic a little later in a session zero of here's how I'm going to do these things, and we're going to let the dice decide most Mm -hmm. of the time. Uh, Exceptions will be if um, I've made a miscalculation and I've put something in place that is overpowered if I fucked I, around, then yeah, they're not going to yeah, find out yeah, that. Yeah, no, no. So yeah. I, I won't let the dice decide that. If it's cool, actually, a lot of times, if it's cool, I'll take a basic roll. It's like, okay, you're going to do this thing that's probably going to require at least three rolls. Now, fuck it, give me an acrobatics roll. Let's see how this goes. Yeah. Um, do that. You're the GM. Just, just make it, you know, yeah. rule of cool. If it's cool enough, like, I really want to see that work, I just need you to make a basic competency check. Yep. But... Uh, Cookie goes, uh, let's say you roll a crit and you had no it would kill the player. Um, do you just tell them it's another number to keep the game fun and the players in the game, or should you kill that poor person? It depends on the stakes. There mm-hmm. have to be stakes. Yeah. As much as I don't want to see PCs die, and I would try my hardest to never kill a PC who's putting their all in and just had some bad luck. Yeah. That's the number I would fudge. But if you've got, say, a gnome who has consistently only targeted the big bad guy <laughs> multiple times again and again and again, then sometimes you just got to let that guy find out because he has literally, you know, you can only taunt the bear so much before the bear bites back. Yes. The other part of that too is I don't think it's necessarily exclusive that the killing the player doesn't necessarily make the game fun. Indeed. In some ways, because one of the, some of the best reactions I have had in games I both played in and GM'd is, yeah, it, it bummed me out when a character I had that I really enjoyed died. But what it did to the story, and then, you know, we ran. We ran with somebody to take them to the temple. We didn't know that this player didn't want to play this particular character anymore <laughs> and had worked out with the DM that <laughs> they were going to, they were going to, at the first opportunity, maybe just sort of die. Uh, but we ran to the temple and rezzed and got and we pulled all our money together to get a res. And we find out after the session, I didn't want to play the character anymore. <laughs> and it, it, but it, it 
forced to change in the story, and it's fun. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes killing the player, you know, will know the stakes. You know the players in your group who can handle it. There's always going to be, and I thought about making this apparent in a game by having, like, you know, roll cards, but I don't think it's necessary. There will be a player who is the big cheese in the game. Mm -hmm. You know, the one who sort of drives things. You can't kill that player without it being suitably heroic or amazing. And uh, so that's the one I would do for. The other ones, sometimes they realize, like, I'm going to do this even though I know it's going to put me in mortal danger. Don't hesitate to kill that person because they know what they're doing. Right. I had one, uh, one of my players, Troy, who I who doesn't play with me anymore because I had to kick him out because he's a little argumentative. But in his shining moment, he realized that the bad guys were going to reach us to the party and they couldn't all escape. So he's like, I'm going to plant the explosive right here next to me on this beam so it'll take it out and crush him and me. And I'm like, that was no die roll required, sir. Self-sacrifice always works. Yep. And that can mean something, you know. That was that was a cool moment, you know. Yeah. It sticks with me years and years and years later. Mm -hmm. uh, but you got to feel it out, you know. <clears throat> I uh, I try hard not to kill players on a just on a crit, um, but sometimes they know that's the way it's going to be. It, it's funny too that that it once you get past like fourth or fifth level, um, and this is a criticism I've heard from some of the old time players, five e makes it really, really hard to just kill a player with a, with a single dice roll. Why, why is that a problem? Assuming you've been playing the character since first level, that is time investment. I feel like it should be harder the longer right. you go. But no, the, 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 the criticism I heard about it is, is that, like, it lowers the stakes. Doesn't. They become and too I'm OP. Like, it really doesn't, but it also makes it harder to do what you just said. One dice roll is not necessarily going to ruin the player's day. And I think one dice roll should never ruin his day play. Right. Like, even the most recent character I killed, spoiler, it was yesterday, um, was a series of dice roll, and I even gave him a way out of it. Mm -hmm. He failed that dice roll, and at that point, you know, a, a dramatic thing had happened dice-wise, so we still made it a cool thing. Yeah. We had fun with it. And sometimes you can. Sometimes you don't need to. You really... It's... Most of jamming is feel. You gotta, you feel if they're feeling like they're getting their butts whipped and all, mm -hmm. you fudge the crits down. Mm -hmm. You know, you let them do something. Uh, you know, I've let them get away from stuff when maybe the beat the bad guys could have been more tactically sound. Yeah. Uh, another thing you have to realize is, you know, I play with a bunch of miniature gamers, so we're all generally tactically sound. But when I get a non-miniature gamer in, I don't penalize that person for not being tactically sound. Yeah. It's okay. And I tend to dumb down a little bit of mine just so they're the PCs, the bad guys aren't right. just like, I've Rube Goldberg my way to destroy every special ability you have. Like, fuck you, John. <laughs> and that's, that's the, there's another interesting part of that with some of the uh, Apocalypse and even Savage World games is GMs almost never roll a die. I like that. Actually, there's a d and it was a fourth edition idea where instead of the GM rolling dice, the players rolled all the dice. Yeah. So instead of their AC being 20, it's like plus 10. Mm -hmm. And the GM has all the set numbers on their side. Yeah. And maybe only needs to roll for damage here or there. I'm like, that was a great idea. Yeah. The PCs feel more in control then. It's a little harder because you can't fudge their dice rolls. But in a game like 4th Edition, where literally it was very... I won't say difficult to kill somebody, but it was not easy. They had a lot yeah. of control over what it is. They can heal themselves a little more than in other editions and also. Yeah, you can't fudge uh, their dice rolls, but you can fudge the consequences of the bad stuff that yes. happened. A lot easier <laughs> than, oh, well, I rolled a nat 20 and the dragon just crushed you and do a fine yeah. face between his toes. Remember that villains are evil and overconfident and will do stupid stuff like take a phase to taunt and cackle maniacally. Mm -hmm. Monologuing. It's yeah, monologuing thing. is a thing. <laughs> Use it. Like, maybe they're just like, so like, we've got this in hand, the bad guy wanders off. The main bad guy who they're supposed to fight decides this is not worth his fucking time and wanders off. That'll inspire the players and let them probably win the encounter that they might yep. have won. And then you can continue. Maybe it does throw a wrench in your works, but that's okay. Being a GM is having a wrench thrown in your works constantly. Yeah, it's not good for your ego. Don't no. expect to have a good ego coming out of a GMing session. <laughs> Actually, I think you can, but the ego should be all yeah. related on whether how much fun they had. If they go right. out thinking right. that was great, it's it's the best feeling. So, 
What time are we? Hey, what do we got? Oh, we got the. Yeah, well, about so let's minutes. go over some game systems. Um, we did a really good discussion on that. What are some? some what are some of your best mechanically game systems that you've liked the most? Oh, mm. Best mechanically. I mean, I'm a hero system guy. Let's. That is abundantly clear by my history. Yeah. Uh, I love the champions in the hero system. I can do anything with it to the point where I've got write-ups for fucking Robotech online somewhere on some website that I did for a guy because I just felt like it. I was bored. Uh, You can do anything. I don't think it's the best system, but I know a lot about it, and I've been playing it for many, many editions. So I've got big system mastery with it. It's a tough question because I think I think I'm going to stick with talking as I said about the the various um, apocalypse like like masks and monster of the week immediately come to mind because mechanically it is driven by the players their choices and their um, approaches to things and you're running the story around it and you can focus on the story that gets driven by their choices and their dice rolls and their ability to figure a lot of these things out. I don't like having to, and this is probably one of my problems with four was I don't like having to check my spreadsheet to make sure this is a good move type of thing <laughs> or check the tables. I want to be able to have some flow. I would and love to argue with you, flow, but I can't. I love yeah. fourth edition. Mm-hmm. I would love to argue with you, but remember, my party was mostly miniature gamers, so it just right. sort of spoke to us. Right. And and let's say this here. Do the system you like mechanically. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about the role-playing rules, because I'm here to tell you, everyone knows how to role-play. Yeah. Everybody does. You don't need rules to tell you. As a GM, you can reward them yourself for role-playing. I, I am, and I didn't actually mention this, I came from the theater kid background. So that's the difference there, I think, between mm-hmm. you know the miniature gaming group and the theater kid group. It's such a different approach, and it doesn't work for everybody. And I'm, no. I don't fault you for liking four. You know, there's plenty of other yeah. reasons to judge you. That isn't one of them. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but I'll say the best feeling is the miniature gamer guy who joined because he worked with you at Games Workshop and is now running D&D games of his own and mm-hmm. having great parties because he really all in on it. Oh, and, yeah. Like, and quickly became your best role player. Hi, Jason. Stereotypes are guidelines. They're not really. Yeah. Really, that's, like, that's kind cool. of where it comes from. Yeah. And that's what I like about the mechanics that allow you to have the game flow as opposed to bogging it down in, I don't want to say minutia, but yeah. having to make sure you're checking the framework. You can't always play a crunchy game. Right. Uh, That's why we switched to Feng Shui 2, which is one of my favorite games, Feng Shui and Feng Shui 2. It is very cinematic. It is very flow. Mm -hmm. They they don't even say, like, don't ever make a map. Have a basic description. Like, people, if I say you're in an apartment, you know, two-bedroom apartment, you have an idea what it looks like. I don't need to describe it. I might need to describe it as something you're not familiar with. But uh, I like that system because it's simple dice mechanics, simple everything. You can run it. And... You may not think so, but simple is good because simple leads to quick system mastery. Quick system mm-hmm. mastery means you can do whatever you want to do. Yep. You don't need the book. You know, one of my players is reading the book. I can make up an NPC on the fly and have him pretty good. Granted, I can do that in Champions slash Hero System 2, but that's more because I'm a fucking nerd. <laughs> uh, Gonzo, what do you got? We can't just, we can't dominate all this. Um, you know, I've been. I've been researching a lot of different RPGs and I'm with you. Sometimes the crunchy just doesn't work. Sometimes the crunchy does, but Mm overcomplicating. And even though I haven't played it, I'm really digging the rule set for die. Um, It's simple and easy. You roll your, if you got a stat of four, you roll four D sixes of four or higher works and any additional, like when you roll a six special things happen. That's it. And it's all based on it. And I thought that was a very quick, easy, simple rule set. And I was like, I want to test this out because it looks really good. So, I mean, I, I've i played every pretty much thing out there. And one of the games that uh, I thought was going to be an easy one was Vampire. Yep. And that got really complicated really quickly after a while. 
And it got complicated of, you know, all of these different powers that blanket and stop each other from happening. Before I totally shit on Vampire, which I'm going to, <laughs> let me first say that I fucking love it because it brought out a different genre of person and the original really encouraged a lot of people who were very story driven to jump into role playing. And I fucking love it for that. Mechanically, I hate it. Yeah. It has gotten worse over the years. I haven't read the most recent, but up through like their second edition, it had just gotten really terrible where it was more likely in some cases to critically fail a task than to succeed. And it just became a detriment to playing uh, that we haven't played it in years, even though I've had like werewolf games that were the most fun. That's where I got mm -hmm. Crusher Bob, who was one of my favorite characters because he was just looking for WrestleMania. But no, I'd say, I'd say one of the things I really want to see this game out and, and test it out. Uh, one of the ones I had the most fun with, and there was a, a lot of fun, and the system was really cool, was Exalted. Um, you had a set of powers, you rolled D10s to do it, but like successes generated new cool abilities on your powers. So if you got like six, you know, you got two extra powers, you know, it, XYZ did this, and it was pretty simple and to the point. Um, and, and it was a D10 system, but it was it was fairly simple. Um, I mean, nothing wrong with a D10 system. You just no. got to make the the rolls work right. Yes, and this just wasn't like okay, I succeed, you do this amount of damage. This is I succeed, but I got X amount of successes. So not only did my power generate the ability to get the success, I threw you an extra twenty feet, or you know something like, yeah. hey, look, my time's up for my uh, my ears. Anybody else? Ten. Just leave them on. Nine. Yeah, you might as well just leave them, let's be honest. Seven. Six. Five. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> I waited. Okay, I know yeah, better. Good call. Um, try to think of this. I mean, I've had a lot of bad systems we haven't played long. Um, some I kind of regret that they were. Um, Rollmaster. Like, one of the most oldest systems there's a ton of rule books some people swear by it i just swear at it i feel it's crunchy in all the wrong ways that's not to say you can't have fun with it remember any system if it's got something you'd like you can tweak it take that shit you don't like throw it out the window keep the stuff you like mm -hmm. but that one just was too like 17 critical charts i'm, I'm joking it's actually more like 100 um, we used to read the critical charts because they were fucking hilarious sure but it was like very egregious uh, not not one of my favorites. Um, I mean, 3.5 D&D. &D. I think most of us have fond memories of 3.5 D&D &D if we played it. Like, yeah, Advanced it was a little busted towards the end, but man, it had so much stuff and fun. Yeah. The only reason I didn't want to continue playing was because it was so hard to run a game for like a 16th plus level group. I spent so much time during the week planning out making villains that were just going to get fucking burked. Yeah. Hopefully, but they did some damage before they worked, but uh, that's the hard part is, you know, there are different game systems that are good at different levels, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, I like, I don't dislike level based. I, I like, I like a little bit of everything. I love Judge each game on what they're at, you know. Uh, oh, Acid Burn Fox says, because Merp's Rollmaster is my favorite in first game. It was more fun to get killed than most games because of crits. Yeah. And Lady B doesn't have fond memories of 3.5. I'm sorry to hear that, but man, it was it was a lot for a while. We had a lot of good stuff in it, but it's just some of them get too crunchy at higher levels. That's kind of what I liked about uh, I like about uh, what I've seen of Fifth Edition. It doesn't seem to get too crunchy at the higher levels. It seems to keep it pretty a pretty even level of crunch, let's say. Yeah, it it gets a little tricky because we made it to the end and had our God ascend and everything else at about on our level twenties. But it gets tricky because um, you can have a sorcerer that's going to bring down a yeah. collective thousand plus points of damage on a single spell to the horde that you have around there. Things like that. So there, there's, it adds a level of less crunch and more, I really have to think this encounter through type of thing. And the economy, uh, action economy becomes. Yeah, at times. But that I I at the same time though. So 
it, it still, I mean, D&D's always been that way. That is, I think that's the defining function of D&D in higher yeah. levels. Yeah. Uh, it was one of the things we liked. So we played 4th edition from 1st level to 20th level. Mm -hmm. The 20th or 30th? 30th level, sorry, because that's where it ended. And um, enjoyed it. It was still eminently playable at 30th level. Maybe not necessarily as interesting, but still eminently playable. I'm trying to think. Actually, honestly, I find the game matters a lot less than the people you're playing with. Yeah. Most yeah, games you can get around. You can make them work. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe except the World of Cinnabar. That movie, that game was fucking crazy. Never played that one. <laughs> I mean, we played it like twice, and it was just batshit crazy, and we ejected both times. Like, we can play something else. Like, let's go play Marvel Superheroes again. It was much easier. I do find that nowadays, the easier the game, the the more, the less uber crunchy it is, the more we go back to it because it's just easy to play. Yeah. You know, you got a new party, you got, new, you got a couple new people in the party. It's easy to teach them, and you got to balance that because you don't want to jump. No one wants to jump into champions necessarily. You know, I had a couple people who, uh, when we ran a big champions game, one of them didn't even bother learning the rules. He's like, just tell me. So I, it was the hardest thing for me because it made I do mm -hmm. a lot of extra work, but you know, he still had a good time. Yeah. Because I put the extra work in for him. But yeah, so I mean, it's a lot more about who you play than what you play. Now, that being said, you probably want to go with, go if you get a new gaming group, go over the sort of things and games you don't like so they can try to avoid that. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of interesting when you just said that, it hit me. It is kind of interesting, the uh, especially over the past two years, how the landscape has changed because of the pandemic and everything. Mm -hmm. um, when when you were saying that, I'm like, okay, so my game group now is spread across four different Discord servers and these types of things. And it hit me on how we were talking earlier about, you know, I, I didn't get to play because I couldn't find players or other people to run the games. It's so different now on mm -hmm. that on that level of oh hey I want to try this is anybody running it and I'm like oh yeah this guy over here I'll put the I'll have you I'll let him let him know and you, you can find these things oh. and it just really really struck me because that's how I've been learning new systems more than I ever did before yeah I was uh I was in uh, Vegas for a convention and for my hobby streak I read the MechWarrior Destiny rules that I'd purchased. And when posting on Twitter, someone's like, oh, hey, we're running that on Monday night. You want to jump in with us on Discord? Like, you go from hard to find a game to suddenly you just post on Twitter and someone who randomly follows you is like, hey, you want to play with me? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's it's crazy. I need to get better at online gaming. I haven't done a ton, but I think that's yeah. the, it, new, the new we got to get used to it. Yep. And it makes it easier to try and do some of these experimental things, too. Mm -hmm. Like, I, the Twitch, uh, not Twitch, jeez. Um, itch.io had those bundles that they put in for like Ukraine and for the Texas trans youth and things like that. And there were like 500 different things they threw in there. I picked up both of them because it was good cause plus a grand total of like $20. I think it was. I've been pulling those things out of there and just trying even the little ones, the journaling RPGs mm. or the little things like that, the little one players or the two player things or the play by mails. And I've been learning so much about other systems doing that. And buy every, if you can afford it, buy every role playing you get, you game you can in a genre you like, because you can steal that for whatever mm -hmm. you're doing. I have so. superhero source books from so many different games, just so I get ideas for characters. Because yeah. honestly, at a certain point, you're like, I don't have another idea for a character. Hold on. Oh, this one's cool. <laughs> Let me steal that. Yep. Oh, I've, I, I have purloined so much. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you steal whatever you can. I mean, there's no... no. Even Heroes Limited. Uh, Cookie Mandis, I played a shit ton of Heroes Limited. It was my... I'll say technically first actual superhero game I played. Uh, do I like it anymore? No. It's a terrible system. But when you're in fucking elementary school, it's great. Mm -hmm. Because you're just rolling dice and having fun. Hell, making a character for that is like an hour or two long session of what the fuck did I just make? <laughs> I wouldn't play it, but even their books, their their villa books, they have some interesting ideas for that. So I, I steal those. 
all the time. That's that's a great topic for a different podcast is when you were starting and what you're doing now, how have those tastes changed? Oh, yeah, gosh. I mean, I think all of us have a, one game in common all the time, and that's D&D. Mm -hmm. Not that I've played 5th edition, but that's just a matter of me finding a group, really, more than anything. Okay, we'll talk. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we can always include you in. I mean, look, I've art. I've, I've got the Dungeons and Doggo stuff. I want to run it, but one of my yeah. my roommate is uh, apparently has a problem with playing super intelligent animals who are adventurers because he's strange. Hmm. <laughs> we all have our problems and crosses to bear. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, guys, it is now media section time. Uh, oh Slade. You've seen it. Don't know if you know it, but we do have our rating system. Rating system is from uh, Casablanca to being the greatest movie ever made and Cats the it's movie true. being the mm -hmm. worst movie ever made. And, of course, Still we true. have our uh, Space Herpes rating. And, you know, uh, zero Space Herpes is better than having Space Herpes, uh, which is five is the, the most Space Herpes uh, that you want to ever have, and you don't ever want to have that anyway. So... Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and go with something, and I'll give, you know, I'm sure you've seen this, but we'll give you a, a, a rundown. Um, I only have like 75 things to talk about, of course, like usual. Um, it's a light week. Yeah. It's I like, mean, God doesn't have a life. What do you want? <laughs> true. Um, what was it, something that I did watch? Um, so there was a movie, Sandra Bullock movie. I think it was on Paramount Plus. Decided to watch it. Uh, now, I like Sandra Bullock. She's a great, great actress. She's nice and she's fun. She's pleasant. Um, and it was called Lost City uh, mm. with Channing uh, Chen, uh, Tatum. Mm. Ch uh, 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 Channing Charming Tatum. Potato. Charming Potato. And, yeah. <laughs> and pretty much, it was like they were trying to do Romancing the Stone for a new generation. Mm -hmm. How would you remake Romancing a Stone? It's perfect. Yeah. And so, and that, that's the best way to put this for the people who have seen Romancing the Stone. She's an author that writes about something, but she finds out that what she's writing about is actually real. And, but the person that's going with her is the Fabio on the cover of all of her books. Okay. You know, that makes, God, I fucking love what Channing Tatum does anymore. He doesn't even fucking yeah. care. He's just like, yeah. He'll bring it in anything. Yeah, and, and it was actually pretty good. Now, the movie's more of a comedy. It's not that great of a, a, an adventure thing, and it's not taken serious in it in any way possible. Um, it's not a bad movie. It, it wasn't, you know, there wasn't anything really great about it. I mean, it's a good time waster. There's a couple of funny lines, but, I mean, you see every plot as it's going along. You're like, oh, yeah, this, 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 this. There, there's nothing should shock you. So, I mean, this really gives me my, my meh reading of, like, you know, 2.5 space herpes. It's just right in the middle. There's nothing wrong with it, but there's nothing really meh. good with it. It's a solid meh type thing. So, I give it 2.5 space herpes. So, Slade, give us something <clears throat> that you've watched, read, or seen. Well, so, lately, oops. I just had something, uh, a website autoplay sound in the background. I got to find it and kill it. Um, uh, so this past, it's funny the, the past week I've done two things one gone to comfort food TV watching where um, the as well as the opposite which was start watching season three of the boys uh, but uh, I went back and I have been doing a few things rewatching some uh, some old movies Rewatching some of the uh, Eccleston and Tennant Doctor Who's, oh. uh, stuff like that, sort of the comfort food thing. I've had a busy few weeks, so that was sort of my. I'm sitting here working and I'm watching something on the side, you know, my mac and cheese, yeah, uh, things. What I did see though is everything, everywhere, all at once. Oh, I want to see that. I'm I'm waiting for it to come on so I can watch it because everybody said stuff about it. Um and. I hated it at the beginning. Okay. I love the entire cast. I really do. I was like super psyched coming in. The first like 10 minutes of the movie, I hated it. 
I'm like, oh my god, why is everybody raving about it? And then the movie started <laughs> about ten minutes in, <clears throat> and and it picked up. And I, this is one of the most enjoyable movies. I'm not going to take the uh, the Casablanca route that you see some folks on social media <laughs> taking, uh, but it was it was so much fun. And the, the the various little twists and um, I have always had I don't want to say like a, a screen crush, but I've always had a real thing enjoying Jamie Lee Curtis. Oh yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis in this is I uh, I was just blown away by by her in this. So um, that would be like I said though the beginning throws a bunch of stuff at you and you're sort of like, okay, I understand that they're setting some, you know, beginning a little exposition, character development. Uh, James Hong makes an appearance, which is always, always a joy. Goddamn right. Um, but it, there's like the, 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 the beating you over a club with certain stereotypes, which makes <laughs> sense later. Uh, was was tough to get through, so I would I would I would give it maybe a single space herpy because of that. Gotcha. Hey, Banyan. Hey, Banyan. So, John, do you have something that you and I have not watched yet? I mean, probably everything I've watched, you've watched. Okay. Uh, I'll actually off what he says is uh, Miss Marvel episode one. Mm. Uh, I am not going to give it a bad rating, but man. Much like that first episode of Stranger Things, is they go hardcore into the high school family stuff that is, from what I understand, because I have a Pakistani uh, person who works with me and explains things in the world, a hundred percent on point. <laughs> That's what I've heard too. <laughs> but it also ticks every fucking button, like just pushes all my buttons of. God damn, that seems like bad parenting to me. <laughs> like did you, a, it, it's it's realistic, but fuck, it just seems like bad parenting. I would never do that. I'd probably be a horrible yeah. parent, but I wouldn't fucking do that. There was, and there was, I agree, and there, but there was this one scene where I have never felt so bad for a parent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where I'm like, oh, oh, because I, I have two sons, they're grown. Yeah. And but went through the teenage years, and I'm just sort of like, yes, no, I can absolutely feel that icy fist crushing you the life out of your chest. See, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I know the scene, and I'm gonna say, while I maybe didn't enjoy the episode as much as I could have, I can't rate it badly because it, it feels like it's absolutely fucking on point, and you can I love the characters in it, and you can you tell know, that they're they're gearing and this. I love her buddy. It's it's this is gearing up to be great. Yeah, you can tell that they kind of geared this for a certain crowd to begin with, and you can do it. It is definitely like a teenager type pull to it, but I like the and it, someone mentioned that it's got that Scott Pilgrim type of feel on yes. some of the scenes uh, with the little things. Yeah, the yes. artistic choices, and I was like, okay, uh, Miss Marvel, uh, Bainey on and. I can't give it a bad rating either. I'm not going to really give it any rating until it's after it's done because this is a limited series. So we're going to get the show and it's going to be done and we can rate the whole thing. I'm enjoying it. Cinematography is fine. But you can definitely tell that this is a geared more towards... It's going to hit... It's going to resonate with people a lot more and I think it's great for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, media should make you feel and it makes you feel and more on that later since I got more media that makes me feel. Which is, which what really interesting is the girl that plays and I don't, I can't remember her name. This is like her first job as an actress. And also she was a huge Miss Marvel fan. Oh yeah. Pictures of her cosplaying her when she was younger. It's fucking great. Yeah. (laughs) Which is even better on it. But I agree. Uh, I didn't hate it. Um, Watch it. I don't give you feels and ways just because if you really hate teenage drama, just push through it. It'll be okay. Yeah. yeah. It is all set up for what looks like it's going to be a great series. Yep. I yeah. Agree. I will say one thing, this, the cinematography as somebody whose family grew up around Jersey city and around Newark, I really appreciated that they really, they, it's, it's only, I think obvious if you spent a lot of time in that area is they went to a lot of effort to capture the real feel 
of that particular <laughs> section of the city. And I I loved that part of it. It's like, oh, my God, that is so by where my grandfather lived. <laughs> awesome. So no rating yet, but still good to go. Yeah, should should watch it. Should watch it. Um, So I've been watching a show, and it's on Apple TV+, Plus, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing because they're getting a great budget. Bad thing is it's not everybody has Apple TV+. Yeah, but, but it's not expensive. It is the cheapest streaming service. Yeah. It's just, it's another streaming service. Yeah, but type thing. it's cheap and it's got Ted Lasso. And I really want to watch Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso. Clips and it looks so fucking good. Zero space RPs for Ted Lasso. I, I, yeah, I'm I dying for the new season. I, I haven't seen any of it yet. And I have friends that are judging me so harshly for not yeah. watching Ted Lasso yet. Uh, being on cheap is like five bucks. And that's if you don't bundle. Hmm. Um, so I've been watching something, and I I think you would love this show, John. Um, I think it is really, really good. I've been watching For All Mankind. For All mm-hmm. Mankind is a alternate universe of the space race on Earth. Uh, no spoilers, but uh, this is it, – it, it's obvious. Um, Russia got to the moon before us. And so since Russia got to the moon before us, it starts this space race. And the space race doesn't end. And so it's like, what happened if Russia made it to the moon first and the space race never stopped and we kept on improving and kept on improving and kept on and kept on and kept on. So it starts like in the, you know, the beginning of the space race. Uh, Season one is like the beginning of the space race up to like 75. And so the timelines are different and alternating and stuff. And between season one and season two, you can watch these little blurbs of what happened because season two starts in 84. And they tell you, hey, here's stuff that like happened in between. And it's kind of cool seeing these alternate timelines that happened, not only a space race, but within, you know, things within the universe. And like just things that happen, you know, women, women getting into the space program early, you know, all this stuff. Um it does not 100% you know go with everything that's happening on the moon and in NASA it also deals with the family and you know what happens when my husband is stuck on the moon for you know so many days and he can't come back because of things and it deals with you know death and life and all this other stuff and it's one thing that tripped me out more than anything and it shouldn't because I've, I'm used to it but now that the world has moved on is seeing everybody smoke everywhere. So they got, you know, NASA Capcom, and, like, everybody in there is smoking a cigarette indoors. And you're just like, okay, culture shock. Okay, yeah, this is back in the, you know, the 60s and 70s, when it was still okay to do that. I mean, hell, 80s even, let's be honest. Yeah, well, it's still going on. But, I mean, it's just kind of a trip, you know, seeing that still. Uh, And the toxic masculinity that comes through, you know, men are men, we're astronaut, you know, that type of thing. And seeing these characters grow has been really, really good. Uh, Each season is 10 episodes long and they're an hour a piece, but they are just so good. Uh, Very well written. Uh, Characters are really good. There's a little bit of, you know, there's a couple of little bit of times that are a little low, but they're just like, you, you can't be perfect every episode. I mean, that's just kind of how it is. But, I mean, for the most part, it's been really solid. I really care about pretty much everything that's been going on, all the characters. The jump between season one and season two, I was like, "Where's wh- who's this character? But I didn't watch some of the stuff that was in between uh, between it. But, I mean, it wasn't no, no big deal. I highly recommend this. It is historical sci-fi is the best way to put it. Because it's an alternate timeline. That's the best way to put this. Because um, in 85, they start to have electrical cars. Because science didn't stop progressing. Because of this, because the space race is still going. Type thing. And so they were pushing all this stuff. Because it's all about funding Russia, of course. Um, but I'm enjoying the shit out of this. I give this probably maybe half a space herpy. If anything, just because there was a little bit of jump and a, a flu, few little things, I'm just like, eh. But there's some scenes in there that are like emotional tearjerkers, and you're like, fuck, why couldn't we have that shit now? 
<laughs> you know, type thing. Uh, but I highly recommend it. If you have, if you have Apple Plus, uh, watch uh, For All Mankind. It is super solid. Season 3 just started up Friday. And, of course, they do one episode a week, so you have to wait every week. But I'm working through season two. And but that's fine. I ain't got time for yeah. binging anything anyways. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I'm, I'm like, immediately watching this. I love the show. This show is very, very solid. Very good. Uh, everybody says that season two is the weakest of, of the two seasons right now. And so I'm still enjoying it. So I'm like, cool. It's good. Awesome. Slade, what you got? Um, actually, other than that, like I said, I've been doing a lot of the, the comfort food stuff. I have, uh, I did watch Miss Marvel. I 100% agree. Um, it, there's a lot of, and I've been, like, I've been hit or miss on the first episodes of the various Marvel shows. That's fair. Coming out. And, like, it's been like, uh, and in the case of Moon Knight, for example, it took it. I wasn't into it on the first episode, but now it, I, I loved this the way this, this the series worked out. Uh, so I I I've always had these sort of things about first episodes. I'm gonna I'm gonna take it as it goes. Starting it didn't start with Wandavision. I'm like, what the fuck's going yeah, on? Yeah, I ejected on <laughs> Wandavision during the first episode, but that's um, but so that was that. Um, I did, as I said, started watching season three of The Boys. Uh, where, and, and so I am one of those people that I love watching envelopes being pushed. Oh yeah. Um, and the first, and the, I'm going to avoid as many spoilers as I can, but the first five minutes of the first episode tells you, they just come out and say, here's what we're going to be. Yes. You, you may not like it. So we're giving you this warning now. Uh, and, and, <clears throat> Since then, they have up in the beginning of season three, the first 15 minutes of season three, they took it to yet another whole new level. Oh, yeah. I, I've heard. Um, <laughs> and so I, I I am really enjoying it. I am a Carl Urban fan anyway. Oh, man, yeah, Carl Urban's great. Uh, he's so good. Uh, and I'm I'm really enjoying it. It is not for everybody. This is one of those ones I can take my time and do what I want because nobody else in the house wants to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't watch it because it's not my thing. I know it's not my thing. Well, and that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just, I dig it. And I'm just sort of like, oh, wow. But I see, and that's for, you were talking about sort of the alternate fiction with For All Mankind. I kind of, what I love about this is the same reason I love the Injustice series when it came out through DC is remember these people are human they're not all going to be clark kent and Correct. diana troy you know they're they're uh, diana prince rather they're donna troy uh they they are humans they are Sorry. flawed they are just uh, they can be awful people and be honest every t every person that's ever wished boy if i had superman's powers you would be an asshole you would, at some point in your life, as heroic as you might be, you would use that power to be an asshole. But only the bigger assholes. <laughs> well, <laughs> sure, John. Sure. <laughs> this this show, it, it pushes the envelope. It, it, yeah. And it's not for everybody. Uh, and this season, really, I, I'm watching this and I'm like, oh, fuck, this season is going to be bad. I hear that first couple minutes of episode one is basically their version of the Battlestar Galactica rioters killing off a bunch of pilots when they were told that they were being too dark and they need to be a little more uplifting. Oh. So they start uplifting and they make it dark, and then the writers, the, the producers are like, all right, fine, do your fucking thing. We're not messing with you anymore. Yeah. This yeah. one, I, I'm watching this, and I'm like, fuck, this season... I think this is going to be the roughest and most dangerous and violent and gory season of all time because th the story's coming to a head. Yeah. Eventually this bl the boys are is going to have to end and this seems like the climax of that story because each episode is getting worse and worse and worse and not just in Boy. violence and gore in attitudes and mm -hmm. what's going on. They got season 4 coming. Yeah, they already have season yeah. 4. Yeah. So I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if like Season five might be the last season. Well, like, it's based off a graphic novel, so there is a limited amount they can go with. Well, you hope that they would do that. I mean, 
it seems like they're going to, from what I understand. But, yeah. you know. I'm hoping yeah, they yeah. do. I, I don't want this to go on infinity. I want this to be, here's the story. This seems like we're right at the climax. Like, this season is the climax, and then we go down. So. Yeah, and I think I think that's actually the, the right thing. The, the arc, um, and I was talking about this with somebody. We were, I was introducing somebody to Supernatural this weekend and talking about how the original plan was five seasons. And they hit that, and Supernatural is the exception, though. They hit those five seasons. They hit their story, and they decided to continue, and it worked. Yeah, it almost never does. Yeah, and that's what I want for the boys is to hit that end, hit that the the end of that story point, just let it stand. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, it is getting dark. It is getting rough. The violence actually to me is almost secondary to just sort of the 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 attitude and the character shifts. And there's yep. one character in particular who's just shifting more and more as. Uh, he's going through these experiences. It's tough, but I love I love it because they're actually the story and the the writing, the dialogue writing is so good. Yeah, it's solid. Uh, this I said this season I'm just like we're only what four episodes in, five yeah. episodes, something like that, and I'm like this is really good, but oh fuck, this is gonna be bad. Suppose I haven't read the article. So I don't, this is secondhand, supposedly one of the main cast members, and I don't remember if it was uh, the, the guy that plays Homelander or one of the other characters, says he actually will not watch the finished version of one of the episodes. Oh. Or just will not watch it. Fair enough. John, what you got? Uh, well, uh, speaking of uh, TV shows making me have the feels again, uh, the most recent episode of Strange New Worlds, Fucking A. Which episode? The the recent one, the one this week. Oh, Strange New World. Sorry. I was thinking Stranger yeah. Things. Uh Strange no. New World. You know what? That was a good episode. It was a great it may have been the best episode yet. It is feels in every way. It's a roller coaster ride of feels and, and it's one where there's not like there's a right necessarily a right answer at the end of it, you know? You get there at the end, like, I, god damn it. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but yes, I want to, I want violence to the answer, but violence isn't the answer. But, you know, letting it go may not be the answer either. It was great. Um, I'll be honest, Strange New Worlds is knocking it out of the park episode after episode. Uh, we have not had Star Trek of this quality consistently ever. Uh, apologies to all of you guys who like Deep Space Nine. You know what's funny is even though, for the most part, each episode has been episodic, but they're building There's... characters still, but each one is its own individual story, it has still been super, super solid. You still need to watch them in order to get all the the everything. The character building. You can get some idea without, but yeah. Well, even little things. The, yeah. the You know, the doctors, the doctor's secret, if you will. Correct. Not yeah. to spoil anything for anyone. Mm -hmm. But no, it's great. It is... Uh, quickly becoming my favorite Star Trek series. Pike is quickly becoming my favorite Star Trek captain. Captain uh, Kirk and... in the sexuality department, he is not, though. <laughs> no, but it doesn't have to be. It <laughs> is great. Uh, it is... If I could only watch one TV episode a week, that is the one. Yeah, it is super Hands solid. Down. Yeah, I, I have been thoroughly enjoying... Uh, that season, it, it, it's one of my top ones. I'm like, oh, Thursday, ding, here we go. Uh, it, I will say it is the best sci-fi on TV right now. It is really solid. Um, Cookie, I think what it is is Kirk always knew how to get the women in bed and never stammered over, you know, he was a suave debonair. And in this episode, Pike kind of tripped over his tongue a bit. more like a real guy, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he, he acted more like, you know, a real person. So as as somebody who is saber not phaser as far as the amount of knowledge and experience in a particular fandom, um, would I have to like finish Disco or any of those things before I went into Strange New Worlds or oh, Picard or any of those? No, you'd probably want to see season two of Disco, which means the first two seasons. Yeah, I've seen of Disco. I've seen up to I've, I'm like part way through season three. Then uh, you can but, jump right yeah. in at that point. You don't need to see anything else. I mean it rewards for you watching recent stuff 
but you could just jump right in. It is fucking great. Cool. The, the one thing I really hope that they do is they start bringing, as, as the seasons progress, because you know this is going to get renewed. If it doesn't get renewed, there's going to be people, you know, riding in the streets. But I would like to see the, I would like to see more, you know, original StarCast characters, Star Trek characters come back in. But I only, wouldn't. only like. I don't even like as many as they have. I think that is. I think a I would. Weak point, but. I, it it makes things not make as much sense. You don't want people to have fridge logic, you know, because it always hurts the series where you get the fridge in the middle of the night grabbing a drink. Like, wait a minute, that shit didn't make any sense. <laughs> I would like to see. I would, and they don't have to be like constantly on the show, but it would be cool to see like Chekhov come through. A young checkoff. No, no, God, no. He'd be way too young. He'd be <laughs> or fucking some, 12, dude. But that's what I'm 12. saying. I'm just saying as example. I don't know the whole history of theirs, but so, it would be nice to see some of those type of characters. Her, her and Chapel already make a problem because based on the, the timeline they give you, the whole Kirk Enterprise stuff doesn't take place until 10 years after this. So that causes slight problems age-wise with things. So it's better not to court more disaster, potentially. It seems okay for now. I'm, I'm okay with the way it is going. It's not too much. But it, it could... You could get those points where you're like, that shit doesn't make any sense. And I don't like getting there. I think they're doing a good enough job where they're at. Oh, I, I would like quality to... week after week. That's all I fucking care about. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will say... I, like I said, I would like it just for a fan reason. But I really... I really I, dig this show. It is it yeah. is high quality sci fi. Yep. It, is, it is one of the top shows on TV right now. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. So I did. <laughs> so I read the entire beta rule set for the game Die, which is based off of the graphic novel RP graphic novel. Um. And so, like I said, it is just a beta rule set. But I am very much digging this RPG more than I thought I would. It does touch on a lot of touchy subjects because it deals with flawed humans. Um, but it is very, very good. Um, I like that in this book that even though you are touching on real world situations, they do include the X card, which we, you know, we were talking about in the RPG which I think is a great thing for people like, Hey, I'm not into that. You know, let's change the subject or whatever, or that's the topic we shouldn't touch. Uh, but they also deal with aftercare. Like, Hey, once you're done with the game, check in with your players. Yes. Type yeah. thing. Do you, was this okay? Did anything bother you? You know, you want to continue playing, you know, this type of stuff, which I think was really good. Um, I'm in, I'm reading the comic. Uh, like I said, it's a graphic novel. And, this world is a really big trip because at one point Tolkien walks through <laughs> while they're in the fantasy world. That's funny. So it's a really big trip. I'm just going through it. I'm going to finish reading it. I'm passing them off to a friend of mine so she can read them. Cause she was like interested, but like, wow, this is weird. And I'm like, yeah, but it'd be something worth I can do. Um, like I guess I will be, um, Running this as a demo with my current uh, online group. Uh, we've got to add a fifth person. But uh, to test it out, to make sure I can try one, I can try to get it within like a four-hour window because I'm going to try to run this at uh, Warfare Weekend. Uh, and also I have some cool things I want to give away with this because the way this system is set up, uh, it's going to be really cool. So I'll give a further review once I finally get the full uh, rule set from the PDF uh, since the... Uh, Kickstarter finished, but I'm thoroughly enjoying the system more than I thought I would. Very simple, very easy, and it's so cool. It's, it really pushes a lot of buttons with me. So, Slade, you got anything else? No, actually, um, I had been having these down weeks, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm writing... I'm coming up with some things. I've been doing a lot of getting back into map making and things like that. So uh, that's kind of where my head's been at a lot lately. 
uh, as well as going through my mac and cheese TV. <laughs> <laughs> mac and TV, cheese TV is good. Baney on just watching NCIS, so he puts it on downstairs, and I'm like, stop. He's like, you can change it. I'm like, I ain't changed it. NCIS, you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> I will uh, say, it is nice revisiting some of those old episodes, uh, the Eccleston and uh, oh. Tennant episodes of Doctor Who. Uh, I've always been a David Tennant fan for a lot of different things. He's a yes. phenomenal actor. Uh, but just seeing the way that the, the character developed after growing growing up with a, as a Tom Baker wannabe. Uh, loves me some Tom Baker. I could not find anybody that could tell me what a sugar baby was in <laughs> suburban Boston in the 80s. Uh, but uh I, I've been really just enjoying getting back into that and seeing the character develop like that. Um, someone did mention, and I, I wanted to talk about this Kenobi episode four. Mm. Uh, we got we got a few more minutes. We, we're, we're going over time, but I don't care. I think Kenobi episode four. I think it's the most Star Wars episode they've done. Mm-hmm. Yes. Of yes. out of the entire series, and we've mm-hmm. only got two more episodes left. I enjoyed um, the crap out of it. I, I enjoyed this last episode a lot. There was like a couple of things that were just like, really? Do you have to be that close with a spaceship? But I, you know, but it was just nit, it was nitpick things. But this one was the most. I believe that's an airspeeder, sir, not a spaceship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to be the one this time, actually. <laughs> I was totally actually excited. that was a... I'm the saber, the saber, not phaser. I was yeah. going to pick at that. No, 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 I'll let it go. <laughs> I enjoyed, after being super, super critical of the last episode, I am very much enjoyed this one a lot more. It very much hit the, this is Star Wars. Yes. And it felt like a Star Wars, because in all intents and purposes, there is a format to a Star Wars show or Star Wars movie. And this fell into that a lot more than anything else. Yeah, I mean, it needs to feel like an old serial to a point. Yes. And this did. Felt like an episode. They come in, they need to rescue the princess. Yep. Which, Leia is amazing. That kid's oh, awesome. Oh, yeah. That kid is so... The, I don't know if you've seen yeah. the um, the Adam Project on Netflix. Uh-huh. And the kid that played the young Ryan Reynolds yep. was so dead on. This kid is a little Carrie Fisher to uh, an amazing point. I love her as an actress. Yeah. She's great. She She's... Up until this point, she was carrying the series. Now, you and McGregor's put, you know, taking some of that himself. But I felt like at this mm-hmm. point, she was the main reason to watch it. Mm-hmm. I could see that. So, um, do we have anybody to raid? Anybody got anybody that we need to do? Because I'm looking at my stream. I don't see anybody. Anybody got anybody uh, want to? Raid, uh, Ricky is not a ferret. He's Ricky, playing among us. Ricky is not a ferret? Yes. Totally looks like a ferret, though. R-I-C-K-Y? R-I-C-K-I. He has followed us earlier uh, this earlier this weekend. Uh, oh, well, crap. Oh, it's Rick is not a ferret, actually. He's supposed to be Ricky. Rick oh, well. is not a, <coughs> not a ferret. F-R-F-E-R-R-E-T? E-T? Okay. I'll get <coughs> that ready. Proper animal, yeah. So, guys, we appreciate everybody coming out and listening. We appreciate mm-hmm. it if it's your first time. We appreciate you know that you come in now. We appreciate it anytime. We appreciate that you listen to us on any of the platforms that we're on because we're on everything out there. Um, multiple things. Multiple, multiple things. <clears throat> you, you name it, we're on it. Um, guys, please be safe. Please take care of yourself. We want to see you at the next show. We want to see you at the next convention. We want to see you online. We want to see you online. For more than dice, I'm Gonzo. I'm John. I'm not Kathy. I'm Slade. (laughs) Good night. Good night, everyone. Uh, That did not work. Hold on. You got to make it difficult, don't you, Gonzo? Of course, I always have to make it difficult. I'm new here and I know that. (laughs) I sent you the link.